do it, but then not done it at the time you thought you would do it. You don't get around to it for who knows how long. I promised myself I would have this talk ready last week, and it was officially ready, I think, at about 10 o'clock this morning. It happens, right? We have intentions, but the behavior just isn't quite there. Well, so do intentions predict behaviors? Well, it turns out that intentions are one of the better predictors of behavior, and as a result, we do things to try to increase people's intentions to engage in healthy behaviors. And often this will take a public health type of approach. Um, typically, we provide information. Uh, we try to influence their intention. And the idea being that if you intend to do it, if you just understand it better, then you'll want to do it and you'll go do it. This is kind of the public health approach. Um, by the way, as I go through this talk, I'm sure you'll be able to draw many, many parallels in your mind with what's going on with the current coronavirus pandemic. This is not a talk about coronavirus by any stretch of the imagination, but what's the biggest challenge facing us right now in the country? It's behavior change. And I have to say, from the perspective of a person who's engaged in this field, I would rate our behavior change efforts, and this is not a political statement, by the way, this is across the board. I would rate our, our behavior change efforts at about a D minus. Uh, we could hardly do worse, really. And from the perspective of what we know about behavior change. So you might think about that as we go through this and think about how you might apply it yourself. So I said intentions are one of the better predictors of behavior. We do need people to intend to do something in order to get them to do it. But then there's a problem, and that problem is though they're one of the better predictors, they're actually not very good predictors. In fact, Pascal Sheeran has re recently written and shown evidence that you can change intentions in rather large ways, but this actually predicts rather small changes in behavior. So there is this intention behavior gap. OK, so what do we do to try to change behavior? Well, here are the usual suspects, and I suspect that most of you are familiar with them. I've already been talking with you about creating and increasing intentions. Intentions are necessary. No question about it, and we want to create good intentions. Um, and how do we do that? Well, often we talk about cost versus benefits of a behavior or risk versus reward or susceptibility and severity. This is one that we have going on in the coronavirus. It's probably working a little bit for us and a lot against us. Um, if you believe that you're both susceptible to an illness or a poor outcome and that this will be a severe problem for you, it makes you more likely to engage in a behavior. But if you think you're not very susceptible or if you think you are susceptible, but the effects won't be all that severe, these kind of lead to not engaging in health behaviors. A lot of, a lot of people talk about building self-efficacy, and this is probably true as well. It's hard to imagine people doing a behavior very much if they don't believe that they can actually engage in that behavior. Other people talk about, well, let's look at environmental and psychological barriers and facilitators. When are you more likely to engage in the behavior? Let's call it physical activity. And what might prevent you from doing it or make it less likely that you do it? One example that I've noticed myself, and unfortunately, I'm not an early morning riser. I fantasize that I'm an early morning riser, but it turns out I'm actually not an early morning riser. So a lot of times I end up wanting to be active late afternoon, early evening. One thing I learned a long time ago, particularly when we had young kids, was if I wait till I get home to exercise, the minute I walk through that door, the likelihood that I'll actually exercise probably drops 80% than if I would have done it from my office. So that's one thing I learned right away. There's a barrier if I just take, now I'm driving home and I'm thinking to myself, can't wait to get home, go on that run. That's going to be great. And the minute I walk through the door, everything changes. The kids are there, where's the, you know, et cetera. And you've probably had those experiences too. So it is a good thing to investigate what facilitates the activity, what mitigates against the activity. People these days have been talking a lot about planning and about implementation intentions, this idea that you can reduce some of the variability and the likelihood of engaging in the activity if you plan it out very strictly and you say when you're going to do it and where you're going to do it and who you're going to do it with and what exactly it's going to be uh, and so forth. And finally, people have also talked about getting rewarded for the behavior. Uh, I'm on uh, at CU. We have this. I can't remember what it's called now. I think move CU move where if you are active so many days in a month, 
you get $25 off of your health insurance for that month. And, you know, the truth is, I, I don't think I've missed more than maybe one month in five or six years. And most of the time, it has nothing to do with getting the $25 off. But every once in a while, we'll be getting down to the end of a month, usually in the winter. And I'll say, oh, man, I need three more days of exercise. and There's four more days in the month. And I get it, and probably I get it in part at least because of this reward. So rewards can be important. But another thing that we've noticed, not only do we have an intention to behavior gap, we also have a problem with initiating a behavior versus maintaining a behavior. So I talked about the intentions and the fact that it's really, it's actually not all that hard to initiate healthy behaviors. A lot of people start them. What is very hard to do is to get people to maintain them. And the problem again is they need to be maintained. You can't go on an exercise program when you're 25 and do it for nine months and say, OK, I took care of that. I don't have to do that anymore. All of these behaviors, really any of them that you can think about, for them to be the most effective, you have to keep maintaining them over time. So there's kind of a disconnect that we find when we look at this issue that all of factors can that lead to initiation, uh, or there's a disconnect between this idea that we can get people to begin behaviors, but it's difficult to maintain them. And this has led some people to believe that the factors that lead to initiation of a health behavior are not necessarily the same factors that sustain that health behavior. This is something that hasn't been looked into very much, but we're now beginning to look at this quite a bit and helps to maybe answer this question of, well, why is it that people can start, but they can't stay with it? Now let's take an example of this um, and let's talk about what's involved in initiating a behavior and, and maintaining a behavior. And we'll talk, we'll do this in the context of weight loss. Um, so if you initiate the behavior, well, what motivates that? Well, it's likely then that you value the future outcome. If you do the behavior, you value what will come of it. You have favorable expectancies. Um, and often there's immediate and social reinforcement for beginning a new healthy behavior. Most people are really happy to see that you're doing it. There's a certain novelty to it and a certain kind of interest that that generates. But then what's involved in maintaining the behavior? How do you keep with it? Well, perceived satisfaction with outcomes is one of the one of the sort of driving arguments that's made these days. And there's no doubt that that needs to be true. You wouldn't keep in a, maintaining a behavior that was providing you with outcomes that you didn't appreciate or didn't want. Um, but probably that's not the whole story, and we're going to go into that a little bit in a minute. And what we see in behavior change, or at least maybe with weight loss, is this characteristic check mark where, you know, at the beginning you lose quite a bit of weight. And the, if this is a weight graph, I don't, I don't know if you can, I can't see myself, so hopefully you can see this gesture. But if this is a weight graph and the weight is going down, you get to a certain point and then what happens? You start gaining the weight back. Now, what happened when you were losing the weight? Well, you started off and, you know, it was hard to do, but you had a lot of reinforcement for it. People told you you were looking better. You noticed that clothing fit more differently. You felt a bit more energy. Um, and all these all these uh, really good outcomes were occurring and you kept losing the weight. And you finally, you got down to where you wanted to be. And now the question was, what's going to sustain it? And what happens? Let's say you're uh, a year into this. Are people still telling you how good you look? Well, probably not. The pants are now fitting exactly the same as they did a week ago because you're not losing it anymore. At some point, you stop losing, right? You have to stop losing. And the, and the contingencies around the behavior change rather dramatically. And so when that happens, what are we going to do? <clears throat> well, I think we know what often happens is the weight goes back up and then, you know, we have people at the wellness center that come into our programs and we say, have you ever been on a program before? And they say, well, yeah, I have. And they name one. I'll just name Weight Watchers. I'm not picking on Weight Watchers, but they'll name one Weight Watchers. And they say it really worked great. But then, of course, the question that I have is, and then why are you back in our program if it if it worked great? I mean, we really don't want to see this ongoing check mark throughout a person's life. We really want to see it go down and then stay at a certain level at that point. So I have to confess as a as a scientist, it's good to be a bit humble 
and it's good to be a little bit skeptical. And the humility comes in when I tell you that I'm going to talk a lot about maintenance, but I'll tell you right up front, we don't do a great job in the behavior change literature with maintenance. We're getting better and we're studying it better, but it still remains a challenge. And one of the ways that we've had to study uh, maintenance is to look at people who have actually maintained the behavior change. The National Weight Control Registry, for example, uh, identifies characteristics of individuals who lost and maintained weight loss over a period of time. And what do we find when we look at that? Maybe that gives us some clues as to what we can do to help people make these changes and maintain the changes. Well, one of the clues that we find is that changes are more likely to be maintained when, the, when they're associated with immediate and positive affective or emotional outcomes. In other words, if when you do this behavior, you immediately feel good, that's helpful for you. Now you can see that with activity, that can sometimes be a challenge. Uh, I did a study a number of years ago where we took uh, measures of mood of people, the, the minute they had stopped exercising, five minutes later and 10 minutes later. The mood was great 10 minutes later, but it wasn't so great with the minute they stopped. Um, and so, you know, that can be a little bit of a challenge depending on how immediate you think the positive affective outcome needs to be. We also find that when the behavior aligns with values and meaning or how a person sees him or herself. We did a study a number of years ago with female black African-American triathletes. And one of the interesting things that we found was that those who are more likely to do more than one triathlon referred to themselves as triathletes, whereas the others uh, did not refer to themselves as triathletes. Um, I've got a sign here that says bad network quality. I'm wondering, Heather, can you still hear me well? Yeah, I'm, I'm good on my end. OK, great. Thank you. Um, all right, so identifying and having the healthy behavior become part of your identity can be important. Um, OK, let's see what happened here. Also, um, we want these behaviors to become more automatic or habitual, that is, requiring less executive function so they become something of a habit. I'm going to put the next one up and then I'll talk about these two together so that the, this idea of self-regulation becomes more automatic. Now, what am I talking about here? Well, um, you say exercise or activity. Well, that's a habit for me because I do it every day. So we have to define kind of what do we mean by habit. In the psychology literature, they define habit not so much by how often do you do something, but by what's involved in you doing that thing. So let's say you did do something every day, that would show that you were often doing it, but if you had to really work at it every day, we would say that's not a habit um, because it's requiring a lot of effort, it's requiring a lot of conscious processing on your part. Um, and what we're looking for when we talk about habits are things that you do more or less without thinking about them. And health behaviors are a challenge in this regard because uh, to get outside or to go be active, requires quite a set of complex behaviors to get you there. And it's pretty difficult for those behaviors to be carried out in a relatively unconscious or automatic kind of way. There could be a few exceptions. Um, for example, brushing your teeth. That's probably pretty automatic. Um, now, it's also heavily motivated by what we call negative reinforcement. If you remember, negative reinforcement is not punishment, right? Negative reinforcement is the cessation of an aversive stimulus. So you get up in the morning, you've got terrible breath, it feels terrible in your mouth. You go drink coffee, feels even more terrible. And so what do you do? You brush your teeth. And when you brush your teeth, you feel a whole lot better, right? It alleviates, it gets rid of that negative situation. That might be pretty close to a habit. You don't have to do a lot of thinking about it. Going outside and being active, particularly in the winter, that might require a whole lot more thought and effort. But our goal is to develop habits so that they become less difficult to do and uh, more easy, more uh, facilitate the, the easiness of doing them. Easy, I don't know if easiness is a word, but you know what I'm saying there. And also we find that those individuals with adequate mental health are more likely to maintain a health behavior change and social and environmental support can be important 
for maintenance. So if we're going to build interventions to change health behavior and get people to be more active, to change the way they're eating, and et cetera, we want to build interventions that will aim at creating these characteristics. But behavior always involves some kind of decision. Now that decision, as I've suggested, might be more or less conscious. And this is where I like to talk about the work of Daniel Kahneman just a minute. Kahneman is one of three psychologists who ever won a Nobel Prize. It's tough for psychologists because there is no Nobel Prize in psychology. You have to win it in some other area. Two um, psych psycholo physiological psychologists won the award many years ago for some really interesting work they did on cell and cells in the visual system that respond to certain angles of stimulation. They did this work in cats. It was really quite interesting work. Hubel and Weasel was their name. But Kahneman is probably the only psychologist who won the Nobel Prize for his work that really is in what we kind of think about colloquially as psychology. He won the award in economics. And if you're interested in his work, I would, I would recommend his popular book uh, from a few years ago, Thinking Fast and Slow. It's a, big, a bit of a thick read. If you want to get basically the same information in a much more condensed version, you could look at his American Psychologist article from 2003. But what Kahneman talks about is a what we now refer to as, as dual process theory. So what is a dual process theory? Well, Kahneman points out that we have a system one in which thought or cognition, it's fast, it's intuitive, it's automatic, it doesn't take much work. There's a lot of emotion involved. It just happens. And Kahneman shows that one of the real geniuses of his work was showing how much we engage in this process. If you ask people if they engage in this process, they say no, because people want to think that they're in system two, that what they're doing is they're being very reasonable, they're effortful, they make their decisions based on all the data and so forth. But in fact, what we find is that you spend most of your time in this sort of fast, automatic, effortless processing uh, situation. <clears throat> and why is that the case? Well, it's the case because there's just simply too much information to process. So you have to find fast and efficient ways of doing it. And of course, human beings as living organisms, we try to conserve energy. So if we have to go through a deliberate process for every action that we're going to take throughout a day, we would never get things done. So we have to become system one type thinkers. Now, a good example of this might be driving a car. When you first learn to drive a car, um, it's pretty slow. It's pretty effortful. Well, the car might not be slow, but your ability to control the car, you're not too good at it. It's pretty effortful. It's pretty rule governed, um, but you're working it out. I remember when I was first learning to drive, I was riding with my dad down a road, tree lined road, and apparently a squirrel ran across in front of us, right in front of the car. I didn't see the squirrel. My dad says, did you see that squirrel that ran across? The front? I said, no, I didn't see the squirrel. He says, what are you looking at? The squirrel ran right across in front of the car. Well, what had happened was the squirrel did run, apparently ran across in front of the car down the road a little ways. But where I was looking was just at the lines because I'm trying to keep my car, you know, between the lines. It, this is all of my attention. All of my effort is focused on keeping this car between the lines. I don't see the squirrel. Consequently, I'm not a very good driver really at that point, right? Now I can drive home from work back in the days when I could go to work. And, you know, you can drive along and you can actually do other things and you may get home and not even remember which which way you took home that day. Now, I'm aware of distracted driving problems and all the rest, but clearly driving a car does not require the type of information processing that it required when you were first learning to do it. Well, that's kind of a model for health behaviors. What we're really hoping to do is take these things that, that start off at system two, they're effortful, they're difficult, you got to think it through each time and move them more toward system one. So they become more automatic, more effortless. And we developed uh, down at the center um, a theory about this. Um, by the way, um, centered and I think is behavior in there and behavior, yes, centered and behavior. These are the British spellings because we published in a journal that uses the British English. So just so you know, those are not spelling errors, though there could be other ones around. At any rate, you can see this was really a team project. 
And I could tell you the story about how it came about, but I think I'll save that for later if anyone is interested. But you can see that um, Angela works up, uh, Angela Bryan works at Boulder, um, and the rest of us are in various ways connected with CU Denver, except for uh, Stephanie, who has now moved on uh, from, our, from our work. But we tried to put together a model that would take what we knew about behavior change and kind of put it all into one package. And what we came up with was really heavily based on some of Kahneman's work. And it was this idea of really a dual process model. Now, I'm not going to go through this slide in any kind of detail. I just wanted you to have a peek at it. The, the, this exact slide is included in the article if you want to take a look. But basically what we're talking about is on the left hand of the screen as you look at it, you just see the initiation of behavior going flowing over to the right where we have more maintenance of the behavior. And the model that we're proposing is that you start with a lot of executive function. You start with a lot of planning, a, a lot of having to inhibit some behaviors to do others, and it's very conscious and deliberate. But as time goes on, we want executive function to become less of a player, and this thing we're calling centered identity to become more of a player. So when you first start with an activity, you're not all that great at it. You don't really see yourself as a person that does this thing. It's kind of foreign to you. But over time, we believe that if you're going to be more likely to maintain this behavior, it has to become less foreign and it has to become more internal. It's part of who you are. It's part of your particular identity. And the slide talks about some ways that we uh, that we propose that you would go about doing this, but I won't spend a lot of time in them. If we were to put this back into Kahneman's terms, we would have system two executive functioning over at the initiation stage, moving more towards system one automatic processing in the maintenance stage. Now, in my the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus primarily on one aspect of this model. By the way, we called it maintain it. It stands for identity transformation. So maintain your identity transformation. Um, become instead of a person who went on a walk today, I'm a walker. Instead of a person who rode a bike once, I'm a cyclist, that, that kind of change. And I'm going to talk about it in particular in terms of meaning and purpose in life. So um, in my research over the years, I've been interested in some of these higher order psychological constructs, um, such as meaning, purpose, uh, and some of those. And I've put on this slide just some of the writings that have influenced my thinking. Any discussion of meaning, of course, always goes back to Viktor Frankl's uh, work. Rollo May has also written some really interesting things along this line. The existential writers have a lot to say about it. And there is an existing empirical research base, by the way. One of the uh, most prolific writers in this area, uh, Dr. Michael Steger, is up there at your very university in the Department of Psychology. And these have all been inspirations for me as I started thinking there must be more to maintaining behavior than these basic processes, these usual suspects that we've seen all along. Can we somehow connect behavior change with meaning and purpose and become part of who a person is and how they live their life? And why might meaning matter for, in that matter for health or health behavior? Well, uh, this is a quote from one of Carol Riff's articles many years ago, and she talks about who is it that's likely to take care of themselves. And she says, you know, simply put, taking good care of oneself in terms of daily health practices presupposes a life that is worth taking care of. Now, Stephanie and I, uh, it's kind of interesting how we started this whole line of research. This was a number of years ago. We were at Syracuse University and we were working with a physician who was involved in the Project MOVE, which was a national program. It might still be going. It was a national program at the VA administration hospitals to help veterans engage in more healthy behaviors and become more active. And the physician that we were talking to, she said to us something interesting. She said, you know, a lot of the these folks that I talk to, they don't really see the purpose in it. They don't see, get why they should do it. They enjoy smoking. They don't really enjoy getting up and moving a lot. And they don't really, really find any reason why they ought to do things to preserve their health. They're just not that interested in taking good care of themselves. And as she said that to us, it started striking us, wow, if you're in that situation, it's going to be very difficult to start moving. But we also know 
from the work of Franco and others that people who have strong sense of meaning can do extraordinary uh, things. In fact, they can sort of beat all the odds, you might say, in maintaining behaviors. So we got interested in this. We started thinking about it. We started wanting to do some research. And we wrote a paper just a couple of years ago um, called A Meaningful Life is a Healthy Life. And we talk in this paper about something that I will call global or general meaning, and then something that we're calling meaning salience. So what is this life meaning construct? Well, typically it has three components. Most authors talk about it as a meaningful life as one that has purpose, it matters or has significance, and it makes sense, it's comprehensible, it's coherent to the person that's living it. Um, Mike Steger, your colleague up at CSU, has a really nice quote that I like where he says, meaning provides us with the sense that our lives matter, that they make sense, and that they are more than the sum of our seconds, days, and years. So what mechanisms might there be that would link meaning to health? Well, the overall mechanism is going to be a mechanism of self-regulation, but remember, we're trying to make that self-regulation become more automatic rather than more effortful. And what, how would meaning play into this? Well, meaning might provide guidelines for selecting and ranking goals that are important. It could help us with improving our comprehension or coherence of the world. Meaning systems provide you with an overall view of the world. It could encourage self-monitoring to align the behavior with goals, and it could provide the why for behavior. And by the way, I noticed the American Heart Association lately has been using some a model that's something like your health is the why or something like that. But why should I engage in this behavior? And so if we break it down a little bit more, really there are two pathways for meaning to influence health. We're going to talk primarily about the behavioral pathway today. So if meaning could change or influence how you behave and behavior can then influence health, that would be one path. The other path that I won't really talk about today is the stress management path. And this is the path where we look at things like, let's say if you really are aware of what's important in your life, are you really going to get upset if somebody cuts in front of you in line at the grocery store? Is it really that important of a thing? So maybe it has to do with buffering stress or seeing the world in a slightly different way. But we're going to look at it mostly in terms of the behaviors. Um, but before we do that, one question we might ask is, well, does meaning even matter? For, do you have any evidence to suggest that meaning and health are even related before we try to go about changing people's behavior? And in fact, we do have that evidence, and I will just put this slide up and maybe take a quick drink while you take a look at it. And you can see that there's actually quite a bit of evidence in various studies associating meaning with better health. Here's one of my favorites. This was a meta-analysis a few years ago. 10 studies, 136,000 participants in all of them, followed on an average of 7.3 years. And what they found in the study was that higher meaning did predict lower all-cause mortality over those roughly seven years, and it also predicted fewer cardiovascular events over that time. Now we've done a little bit of work of this type in our lab. We've looked at religion meaning in the MIDAS study, which is midlife in the US. This is a nationally representative sample of about 7,100 people or so, collected in three waves over 18 years. And there you can see the distribution. The mortality data for this particular branch of the study were collected in 2017. We looked at religion and meaning as predictors, and our outcome measures were self-rated health, mortality, and hypertension. And I'm going to go through this really quickly because we're not really so interested in the religion aspect of this today, but we looked at religious service attendance and then this kind of broad composite measure. We also looked at meaning with a seven-item purpose and life scale that Carol Riff has designed. And what we found is when we controlled for age, race, and gender, that both religion variables predicted meaning at the second wave of Midas, which was about 10 years later. Um, the religion variables predicted self-rated health and, and mortality in the third wave of Midas, which was a, over a period of about 18 years. And attendance predicted self-rated health, hypertension status, and mortality. Now, meaning also predicted self-rated health, hypertension status, and mortality. That was over about an eight-year period. 
And then what was really kind of interesting was that meaning actually mediated the relationship between the religion variables and self-rated health and mortality. So suggesting, um, again, if you're familiar with mediation analyses, you can see that there are many flaws in this kind of analysis, but at least giving us a hint that the way the religion variable might be having its impact was through the variable of meaning. All right, so let's go and look at some of our research looking at behaviors and meaning. This is a study that Stephanie and I did. Uh, this was actually Stephanie's master's thesis, as I recall, looking at purpose in life and physical activity. Um, and what we did in this study was we took 104 adults. They completed self-report measures of meaning and some potential confounds. Now, for those of you not in psychology, it's probably hard to appreciate these potential confounds. But in psychology, we, we split hairs and we argue a lot about constructs. Uh, we kind of ask ourselves the question, you know, how many constructs can dance on the head of a needle sort of thing? Um, so if I say uh, meaning in life predicted this thing, somebody else will say, well, how do you know it wasn't optimism instead of meaning? How do you know it wasn't positive mood? And you could go on infinitely with this. So you try to get the most viable alternatives and control for them in your study to see, is it really meaning that we're talking about here? And in this study, they completed the measures and then they wore accelerometers for three consecutive days on a Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And what we found was positive relationships between meaning and total movement. After we controlled for the confounds, the relationship was maintained, so it wasn't due to optimism or mood. And we found similar trends for the moderate to vigorous physical activity and also for self-report of physical activity. Now, we aren't the first people to try to predict things. Uh, there's also been a theory out there for a while called self-determination theory, and we actually are quite comfortable with and like self-determination theory quite a bit, and there's much of it infused in our maintainant model. So in this study, what we wanted to do was see if meaning predicted anything in terms of physical activity adoption beyond self-determination theory. Um, so does it give us more than we already know? Now, I'm in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over self-determination theory here very quickly, but just tell you that basically it's a theory that says if, if, if conditions support your ability to autonomously choose what you do, that you feel competent in what you do, and that you have social relatedness, that those are the kinds of situations that internalize, lead to internalized behavior and lead to maintaining behavior. Now, some of our colleagues argued, and we argued conceptually, but they actually argued empirically, which is even better, that meaning is probably a fourth basic need to go along with those three that I just mentioned. And they provided this evidence in terms of well-being that meaning in life was in fact complementary to and added to um, the ability to explain psychological well-being beyond autonomy, competence, and relatedness. When we did our study, what we wanted to do was examine whether meaning in life predicts change beyond the SDT model. And we also had a secondary uh, component to this study, which actually made it kind of an RCT, but I'm going to skip over that piece of it. I think just in the interest of time, we can come back and talk about that if we want later. So we had 160 folks in the study, uh, average age of 43, largely female. They were joining a university medical uh, fitness center. We did have these two conditions that I mentioned. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll save the uh, excitement here and tell you that there were no difference in these two conditions. So I'm not going to spend more time talking about them. They're a little bit ancillary to our purposes of the study. Um, we had outcome measures at baseline four weeks and 12 weeks, and these were the outcome measures. So two of these measures are self-determination theory type measures. They're looking at the constructs in that theory. One was the meaning in life measure, the presence of meaning in life, and the other one was a physical activity questionnaire, the short form. And what we found was that meaning in life predicted greater increases in physical activity from baseline to four weeks into the study, about 14% increase in variance beyond what self-determination theory would account for. It was not associated with changes um, between, I don't know if you guys can see that, but I just got some kind of a message. It was not associated with changes between, uh, with physical activity changes between weeks four and week 12, but the interesting thing there was most people had made the changes in the first four weeks and then they stayed 
relatively flat thereafter. However, greater physical activity at week four predicted greater meaning in life at week 12, which we'll go back to in just a second. Um, and then this is a, this last one is basically showing us that uh, there was no effect on whether we were doing these, these two various conditions. So what are the takeaways? Well, this was an observational study. Even though we called it a clinical study, really the only reason it was a clinical trial was we were doing more measurement in one arm than the other, and we thought that the measurement itself might be reactive, that people would do more activity because they were being measured and so forth. Um, the meaning in life added to self-determination theory and its ability to predict increased in physical activity. And this helped us to conclude that meaning was helpful for individuals in early stages of behavior change, but it also suggested a reciprocal effect, which I think is pretty interesting, which is that meaning in life and physical activity might work together in a sort of a positive reinforcement cycle um, where one begets the next. And just di doing daily reports did not um, increase activity levels, not associated with more increased activity. OK, so now here we are talking about meaning in life, and I was resistant to studying meaning in life for a number of years, and partly I was resistant because it seemed to me like it was just up in the clouds. How do you really study this thing very much, and how can it really be applicable in people's lives? And then I started thinking, what if you got it out of the clouds? What if you brought it down into the moment? In fact, what if you did that more than once? What if you did that many times, maybe throughout a day? A person became aware of what was more meaningful to them. Maybe then you'd have something that might really have stronger impacts on health behaviors. So we called this drilling it down, and we thought it was a brand new idea. And then we looked back at Viktor Frankl, and he tells us that it's really the specific meaning of a person's life at a given moment. That's what really matters. Now that says 1988, but he actually wrote that much before, before that time. And so we, that's when we developed this idea of meaning salience, your awareness of meaning in the moment. And what we were thinking was, and we put it into a model that looks something like this, that global meaning in life is probably a prerequisite for meaning salience. But we suspected that meaning salience itself would be a more potent predictor of health behaviors. And you can see I've kind of outlined in red there on the screen um, these uh, the pathways that we're looking at. Now, I have to say that I think this model is wrong uh, in that this global meaning in life does have some predictability, as we've just shown, down to these health behaviors. So there really should be a line there. But what we were suggesting is that if we could make meaning more salient daily, minute by minute in individuals' lives, that we might get more bang for our buck than we're getting with just uh, the global meaning in life measures. And so to look at this, we did, we took the data that I've just talked with you about and um, we sliced it in a somewhat different way. And in this uh, study, we wanted to look at if people were more aware of their meaning, would they on a daily basis, would they in fact be more active? So in this study, we only took the 80 individuals who were in this group that I was talking about earlier. These are 80 physically inactive adults. We're studying them over 28 days. At baseline, they took the general meaning in life measure that I mentioned to you earlier. And then on a daily basis, they recorded their meaning salience, their mood, and their level of physical activity. So over 28 days, they every day uh, recorded these. And then we had the outcomes that I mentioned before. Um, although this time I'm going to also highlight self-report of physical activity and attendance at the fitness center, which was an objective measure. We could take that from their center records when they checked in. Well, what did we find? Well, we found that meaning salience after controlling for the demographics, the mood and other self-determination variables predicted fitness center visits so that one standard deviation increase in salience, meaning salience, equaled about a 44% um, they were 44% more likely to visit the center on that day. Daily meaning salience above average for that individual, this is a within person analysis, um, also predicted increased physical activity duration and increased physical activity intensity um, on those days. So we do have some evidence that meaning salience was an effective variable. Interestingly, in this particular study, global meaning itself did not predict the outcomes. Now, we're trying to move forward, and I'll do this very quickly, and then we'll be done. 
Um, we're, we, we're trying to develop some interventions. So the study I just told you about, we measured meaning salience each day, but we didn't try to do anything with it. We didn't try to manipulate it in any way. And we've got a couple of grant proposals in right now where we want to try to use smartphone technology to provide opportunistic uh, personalization of messages. So we send people messages. We try to help them connect with what's meaningful to them and try to connect that then with being more active. Let me give you a brief example. Let's say you're a grandparent. And you say, well, you know, I, I could go walking in the early afternoon. So we might send you a text message at one o'clock that would say, hey, you know, when you go walking this afternoon, wouldn't it be great to, to think about your grandkids and how you're going to be able to play with them next time they come visit or, or whatever, uh, something like that. That's the kind of the idea that we're working on. And we're, we're hoping to get some funding to be able to test this soon. We've done some pilot work that looked promising. I also wanted to mention real quick a study I'm involved in now. This is a multi-site randomized trial to treat metabolic syndrome with lifestyle changes. Um, as you guys know, metabolic syndrome is often recognized now as the first stage of heart failure. Um, there's no single medical treatment for uh, metabolic syndrome, and these are the different characteristics. Typically, it's said that you need three of these five to qualify for the diagnosis. And so what we're doing in this multi-center, uh, multi-site trial is we're comparing an in-person group-based intervention versus an enhanced usual care, not in-person intervention. The program emphasizes physical activity, a veg vegetable but not vegetarian based diet, and various psychological applications of stress management and mindfulness habits. And it includes some of these principles that I've been talking about because what we're looking at in this study is long term change. Um, I'm going to skip over that kind of quickly. Uh, we start off with three months of weekly sessions, then three months of biweekly sessions, and then uh, 18 months of monthly sessions and the outcome measures will be taken at two years with the target goal being 50 percent remission of metabolic syndrome in patients over two years we're studying individuals in four cohorts per site so 30 people per cohort 15 in each group and all total we'll have 600 people that will be followed up over the two years and we're hoping that by applying some of these principles that we've talked about here we might be able to get better maintenance of this behavior over time, but we won't know. We won't know until we, we do the data. Now, what's the elephant in the room? Well, in everything, the elephant in the room is meaning. Um, what if I don't have it so much? How do you get it? What do you, do you guys even talk about that? Mostly we don't in our research, but we have some good clues. Atul Gawande, um, in his book, Being Mortal, wrote this. The answer he believed is that we all seek a cause beyond ourselves. This was to him an intrinsic human need. The important thing was that in ascribing value to the cause and seeing as worth making sacrifices for, we give our lives meaning. If you've not read Being Mortal, I thought it would be a bummer, and there are truly some very sad parts in it. But the trick about that book is when you get done reading it, you realize it's not really a book about the last few months of life, although it supposedly is. It's really a book about how do you live your life um, in light of the fact that you are mortal. And then no talk would be complete without another Frankel quote. And Frankel talks about having a cause to serve another person to love that's beyond yourself. Interestingly, Frankel says self-actualization is possible only as a side effect of self-transcendence. Now we have a speaker coming to our Center for Women's Health Research soon who teaches at Yale. She teaches a class on happiness and I'm blocking on her name here at the moment for some reason. But anyway, um, this is one of the things that she talks about in terms of feeling happy and feeling good. So um, how aware are you of what's meaningful in your life today and how much would you say your actions today are indicators of what is meaningful in your life? And I'll close just by showing you this cast of characters. This is a group that provides a lot of meaning in my life. And actually there are two more that aren't in that picture. That picture was taken a couple years ago and we've, we've added two in-laws to the picture. I need to get a new picture. OK, thank you all very much. Thanks so much, Kevin. Great talk. Um, does anybody? Oh, I see Kayla has her hand raised. Kayla, do you want to just jump in? Yeah, thanks. Um, Dr. Masters, thank you so much for that talk. I um, study uh, motivation for physical activity, and I use self-determination theory as a framework 
So one of the oh. things that has been um, kind of a new, newer idea is that there's some interplay between introjected regulation and then the more autonomous forms. And as soon as you started talking about meaning, I kind of had this aha moment. I'm wondering if you think or you know whether or not more meaning can also then not necessarily lead to, but be associated with higher introjected uh, motivation because, right, like we're trying to avoid guilt, trying to get some of those internal rewards. And, yeah. and I guess I forgot to say that that interplay has also been linked to more persistent physical activity. So I'm just wondering what you thought about kind of those, those three pieces. Yeah, I think, no, I think that's possible. I, I think it could certainly happen. We don't know enough. I mean, I think it's really clear that we don't know enough to say for sure. And, you know, meaning is an interesting thing because um, although I've spoken about it in, in really positive terms, there, there can kind of be a dark side to meaning in a sense that some people find, for example, more meaning when they're more aware of their mortality, for example. So there can kind of be an interchange in that way. Um, but I would probably think of it more in line of, and those of you that don't know this terminology, forgive us for just a moment, but more in the line of integrated um, motivation, hopefully, where you're integrating the meaning and the motivation together, but you're using the meaning to help you um, achieve the goal or maintain the behavior. But any of the, anywhere along that path that's leading toward more internalized or hopefully even intrinsic behavior at the end, um, we're in favor of it and we hope we hope that meaning will help. But I think you could well be right um, that the interjected part could could it play a role in this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have one question in the chat from Dr. Bell, and I think he's wondering um, sort of what comes first in terms of does good health evoke meaning or does meaning give us good health? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And in fact, um, I kind of I think I mentioned it in my talk that in the, in the one study we found that um, meaning predicted activity and then activity predicted meaning. And um, I, I think either one can come first, uh, actually. Um, now, we're taking it from the angle of, of starting with meaning and trying to build from there in terms of healthy behaviors. But I, I think it's quite possible that these two things are, are linked in a way that is sort of an iterative uh, or a, a kind of a positive reinforcement cycle positive feedback loop um, that they both well could be related to each other. Now, now um, there's a fellow named Breitbart who I'm blocking on his first name. He's done some intervention work with cancer patients in a meaning intervention. And he actually finds that on uh, uh, some randomized trials that people who have gone through his meaning based intervention, although their cancer, it's still their cancer and it still does what it does, but they report better outcomes in terms of quality of life and well-being after having this intervention as opposed to control groups. So I think even if health is poor, um, you can still build meaning or enhance a, a person's sense of meaning as well as their sense of, of, of um, well-being. Um, but I, I, I think the two can definitely be related. It's also quite possible to, to have very good health and have very poor meaning. Um, and so, you know, related, yes, but not necessarily and sufficiently so, I, I guess I'd say. And just as a follow-up, I was curious, in the study that you guys did, um, you and Stephanie's study, where you looked at daily uh, meaning and activity um, with self-report, and I think it was um, attendance at a, a, a fitness center, did you use like EMA where you were measuring meaning after their exercise bout, or you did you not know which came first? Yeah, that was a problem in that study is um, we were not able to use true blue EMA. We took the measure of meaning at eight o'clock each evening. Now, one thing that we did in that study was we did some exploratory analysis to see if meaning the night before predicted activity the next day, uh, and it turned out that it did not. Uh, by the way, neither did activity the day before predict meaning the next day, but the relationships were there within the day. 
what we would really like to do is the kind of study that you've talked that you just talked about where it would be more of a real true blue EMA design and we could get more um, we could get more sort of time and event contingent data on on the on the activity meaning relation. Very cool. Um, does anyone have, I think we have time for one more question before we break for our, um, our 793 class. Do we need to blow a horn to wake everybody up? <laughs> I think all the students are saving their questions for class. Um, all right, everybody. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. And um, 793 group will exit this meeting, Kevin. So we'll all exit this meeting and then join the other team's link. Um, Great. In a few moments. So thank you again. And thanks again for everyone uh, joining us. Thank you. My pleasure.